Oh, I'm excited about this message this morning. Uh, up to this point in the book of Joel, it's been heavy and depressing. I mean, the day of the Lord is at hand. By the way, the day of the Lord is a great and terrible day. It's something that, that we ought to take seriously. It's something that ought to wake us up. It's something that ought to motivate us in our lives. We've seen so far in the book of, the Joel, in the book of Joel that the day of the Lord was immediate. Chapter 1 talks about a great locust invasion and how those locusts had gone through the land and completely devastated it. And as a result, they were experiencing famine as a result of the immediate day of the Lord. Then we saw the last week that the day of the Lord was imminent. There was a great army from the north that was making their way towards Jerusalem. And that army was going to go a whole lot further than the locusts went because it was going to climb over the walls and it was going to break into every single house in the city and the city was going to be completely devastated. So the day of the Lord was imminent. And then we ultimately know this, that, that the day of the Lord is ultimate. Each one of these judgments that happened here in the book of Joel and each one of the judgments that, that sometimes happen in our lives or the, the crises that we see that are happening in the world all around us, you know what they're pointing us to? They're pointing us to the ultimate day of the Lord. There's coming a day where he's going to come like a thief in the night and the heavens and the sun and the moon and the stars are going to be dark and God's going to do great wonders on the earth and he's going to come and he's going to judge this world of all of its sin and all of its promise, uh, all of its brokenness. There is a great and terrible day of the Lord that is coming. And that leads me to the title of our message this morning, which is, you guessed it already, made for more. You know the good news of the book of Joel? You know the good news of all of the prophets? Do you know the good news of the entire Bible? Is that we were made for so much more than the judgment that we deserve. Can I get an amen to that this morning? Do you, do you understand today? We deserve judgment. Do you understand that, that you deserve judgment? How many of you would, would agree with that statement right there? By the way, if you're visiting with us this morning and you came today and maybe you were a little apprehensive about being here today and you, you weren't sure what you were going to hear and maybe you're feeling a little bit broken and, and you think you're showing up to a church that's filled with good people. Can I tell you, that's the furthest thing from the truth. You've showed up at a church that's filled with rotten people, all right? And all God's people said, <laughs> no, listen, we're broken. So, sometimes I think we need to be convinced of that. Sometimes I think we need to be reminded of that. And I don't think we have to go much further. Have any of you ever had like one of those thoughts that have jumped into your mind? Maybe it came out of nowhere. Maybe you even dwell on it for a little while, but then all of a sudden you were like, thank goodness that nobody will ever know what it was that I was just thinking about. Anybody ever been there before? Where are those people that go and tell other people what you were just thinking about though? You know, Sometimes there's people like that too, but the point is this. If we're honest with ourselves, we know that we're broken. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we understand that the truth of God's word is right and it's accurate. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we don't deserve his goodness. We don't deserve grace. We don't deserve mercy. We deserve the judgment and the wrath of God. But praise be to God, we were created for far more than that. We were created to sing out his praise. And I have a God in heaven and you have a God in heaven that loves to save, that loves to deliver, that loves to show grace, that loves to extend mercy, and he wants to do marvelous things in our lives to prove that to us and to show that to the world around us that we serve a great, holy, good God. We were made for more. I got three things that we're going to look at this morning. Let's just jump right in. The first word that I want you to get a hold of this morning is the word believe. Believe. Rain is coming, okay? Rain is coming. Rain is literally coming. It's supposed to be happening again today in just a little bit. But look at verse 18. It says here in Joel chapter 2, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. This verse marks a dramatic reversal in the entire book of Joel. And we must believe that the children of Israel took the word of the Lord that came to Joel very seriously. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, you know what he's crying out for them to do? Rend your hearts, not your garments. Repent. Put on sackcloth and ashes. Call a solemn assembly. Gather all the people together, the young, the old. Hey, even the, the, the nursing babies, even interrupt the honeymoons. Those people that just got married, call them away from their honeymoons. Gather them together and cry out to God, spare thy people. 
Spare thy people. You know what they prayed for? They prayed, God, help us not to be a reproach to your name. Help the world around us not to say, where is their God? And you know what? Whenever we pray to God based on the glory of his name and based on his holiness, God responds in an incredible way. And that's what's happening here. Man, the second that they truly repent, get get a hold of this. The second that they truly repented, Man, the Lord responded with pity. He responded with compassion. His compassion and his love moved him to action. I love that they use the word jealous here. Just like a a jealous husband who will not stand for any dishonor of his wife. And by the way, I'm not talking about the kind of sinful, petty jealousy that we know in our world today because we are sinners and broken people. I am talking about a holy righteous zeal that would not stand for the dishonor of his name, that would not stand for the dishonor of his people, that would not stand for the dishonor of his land. And like a righteous, holy, zealous, jealous husband, he steps out and he moves to action and he responds to the cries of his people. And all I can say this morning, how many of you want to be on that side of God's jealousy and that side of God's love and mercy? Man, that's where I want to live my life right there. Well, look how he answers their prayers in verses 19 and 20. Look at what it says. It says, Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. You know what's awesome? This is, again, it's a direct answer to the prayer from verse 17. And he says, You're not going to be a reproach among the heathen. They're not going to say, where is your God? They're going to see your God. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to restore the land from that locust plague. All you see is drought. All you see is famine. But guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to breathe on the land again. And guess what? You're going to have corn and wine and oil, and I'm going to bless you again. Then look at verse 20. He says, but I will remove far off from you the northern army. And will drive him into a land that is barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. I don't know why. I just really like the way this verse ends. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Now, that verse is not talking about God doing great things. That verse is talking about because that enemy army had done great and terrible and evil and wicked things, their punishment was going to be great and terrible and evil. So here you see God answering their prayers, and this army that was, that was zeroing in on the nation of Israel, the army that they had no defense against, God's going to turn them back, and he's going to turn them away, and he's going to destroy them in a miraculous way. Now, there are many scholars that believe that this is referring to the time of Isaiah when Hezekiah was king, and when Sennacherib and the Assyrian army invaded the land of Judah. Now, I told you at the beginning of this, we don't know anything about Joel besides what his father's name was. We don't know what era and time he lived in, so I cannot say this emphatically, but it's a wonderful story about how big and how great our God is. So here's what's happening. The king of Assyria, he moves with a giant army, and they head into the land of Judah, and they get to Jerusalem. And one of the generals goes, and and he cries out. And by the way, as the army said it their way, you know what Hezekiah does? Hezekiah runs to the temple and he prays and he's like, God, we are toast. We have no chance against them. What are we supposed to do? And God says, don't worry, I'll take care of you. The army shows up in the city. One of the generals comes out to, to kind of give his demands to the city of Judah. And you know what? They, they sent out translators that could only speak the Assyrian language. And you know what the general did? He didn't speak in the Assyrian language. He spoke in Hebrew, and he did it on purpose because he wanted to scare the people that were on the walls. And he said, guess what? We're coming for you, and there's no stopping, and you better surrender. Not a single city has been able to stop us. Your city is puny. It's not going to be able to stop you. And here's where he really messed up. He says, even your God cannot stop you. Now, how many of you agree that was a really bad thing on his part? (laughs) He brought God into it, and he says, even your God's not going to stop you. And you know what? Hezekiah is scared. All the people are scared. He goes back into the temple. He prays to God again. God sends Isaiah to him, and he says, hey, don't worry. Don't worry. God's heard your prayers. He sees your repentant heart, and he is going to deliver you. And you know what the Bible says? That night, the angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians, and the next day they woke up, and 180,000 soldiers were dead. 
That's who our God is. Now, now the world will try to explain that away. They'll say, hey, some sort of a plague or some sort of a famine hit them. Can I tell you that the Bible is true? The word, the angel of the Lord moved in the camp and God delivered his people in a way that only he can. And guess what happened to Sennacherib, by the way? He goes back home and he goes into his temple and he's assassinated by two of his own sons. And all of it was a reminder to say, hey, I am the Lord God and there is none like me. God can deliver in some pretty powerful and incredible ways. Now, look at verses 21 through 23. I love where this goes. Okay, so the army's being delivered. So that part of their fears are gone. Look what he says in verse 21. Everybody help me with those first two words out loud. It says, O land, be glad and rejoice. Help me out with this last one. For the Lord will do great things. As great as the devastation was, oh, the healing of the land was going to be even greater. Just let that sink in. As great as your troubles, your trials, the things that you are faced with, you have a God that is far greater and far bigger than anything that you could ever be faced with in your life. Look at verse 22, okay? Help me out with those first three words. What's it say? Let's do that one more time. Here we go. Ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. I love God's kindness even to the animals here. He's talking to the animals in the pasture, and he says, don't be afraid. Guess what? Your pastures are once again, you're hungry right now, but your pastures are going to be full and vibrant again, and you're going to have something to eat. And then look how he starts verse 23. What are those first two words? Everybody out loud. Be glad, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. Can I tell you this morning, believe. The rain is coming. You know, what's interesting about this passage is he's talking about the rain, and you have to understand how important rain was in the land of Israel. For one thing, it was their primary source of water. They had very, other, they had very few other reliable water sources. So if it didn't rain, they were in trouble. And if you read through the Old Testament, you're going to find constantly in the Old Testament, God's blessings were tied to rain. If, if, if you obey me, I will send the rain and I will bless your land. And if you disobey me, I will withhold the rain and I will curse your land. And here he says, fear not, don't be afraid, be glad. Guess what? I'm going to send the rain. December and January were the times where the latter rain would come. And I like how it said even a moderate rain. Just through those months, it was probably just kind of cloudy and gloomy, a little bit like it is going to be for the next four days. I think it's supposed to just be kind of rainy and ugly. And that, that moderate rain would come. And you know what it would begin to do? It would begin to soften the land and get it ready for um, the planting season. And then in April and May, um, that was the latter rain, sorry. And then in April and May, it would be the former rain. And the former rain would show up right after they took the seeds and they planted them in the fields, right when they were in um, th their most delicate time where they needed the water and they needed the nutrients uh, that would feed them. And could you imagine, just, just put yourself there, could you imagine living in an agricultural society that literally your livelihood, everything about your life depended on the rain? And man, in December and January, it's raining and it's doing what it's supposed to. And you know what you're doing? You're sitting back saying, thank you, Jesus, for the rain. And then you get to April and May and those crops are planted and you're saying, thank you, Jesus, for the rain because you know everything's going to be okay. Listen, this is such a silly illustration I'm about to share with you, but like three weeks ago, it didn't rain. Like August, we got to August and we experienced a drought for like three weeks. And all I'm trying to do is keep my grass green and my plants alive. And the sun was starting to fry them. And I'm like having to get up early every day. And I'm starting to get to the point where like, I'm praying for rain. And one day it was a 50% chance of rain. And I said, I'm having faith today. It's going to rain. And I didn't water anything. And guess what? It didn't rain. <laughs> and then the next day it was like a 10% chance of rain. And I watered everything. And it rained. And it rained buckets. But I'll tell you what. I was so happy. when that, I was doing a little rain dance myself. I was fired up. It was raining. And all I'm talking about is my grass and some plants. Could you imagine your entire livelihood being dependent upon rain, your entire life? 
and it's raining. Hey, this is the good news. This is some of the best news ever to these people that, that the curse is going to end. God's not going to judge anymore. He's now going to restore us back to a right relationship with him. And here's the practical application. Start living. Start living. The future is now. Hey, that, that song that we just got done singing, I love it. It says, now I am chosen, free and forgiven. I have a future and it's worth the living. <laughs> we have a future. Start living. I, I want you to notice what's happening here in this passage. He says, fear not, don't be afraid, and be glad. But the reality is, everywhere they looked, there was still devastation. It's not like there was any buds on the trees yet. It's not like the rain was falling from the sky yet. I mean, everywhere they looked, there's no, the trees are devastated. The land is devastated. It's dry. They go open up their cupboards. There's no food to eat. Their stomachs are hungry. You understand what we're talking about here? And God says to them, I'm going to send the rain. Stop living in fear and be glad because if God says the rain is coming, then guess what's going to happen? The rain is coming. And you know what some of us need to do? Some of us need to believe and some of us need to start living because I promise you this, there are days when you open up your eyes and all you can see is devastation. All you can see is the enemy. All you can see are your troubles and your trials and your problems and your cares. But can I tell you, the Bible says that the rain is coming. When God says to cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you, God cares for you. When God says he's going to work all things together for your good, he's going to work all things together for your good. When God says, I will be with you as you walk through the valley of the shadow of a death, he will be with you. When he says he's going to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies, he will prepare a table. When he says goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life, Goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. I could go on and on and on because the Bible is filled with promise and blessing after blessing. And when the Bible says, and when God says it, it's going to happen. So if the rain is going to come, the rain is coming. So believe this morning. Let go of your fears. Let go of, of your troubles and your trials. Be glad because God wants to bless and if you're right with him, you can expect it to happen. So believe, the rain is coming. Secondly, this morning, I want us to see this. The word claim, claim, restoration is real. Now, verse 25 has an incredible promise. And i got to be honest with you, I never saw this one before until I studied it this week. This is one of those new, like I love it whenever I'm studying and, and like a nugget, something new just jumps out at me. And I... The, the, the Bible is a treasure of unsearchable riches. All the days of our life, we're going to be discovering and learning new things. Some of you may have already heard this one, but for me, this was fresh, and this was new, and this was amazing this week. So look what it says in verse 25. Y'all read that very first line with me, okay? Here's what he says. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. I'll read the rest of the verse. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and my great army which I sent among you. God will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. The wasted years. First of all, I want, I want to talk about the first part of that. The years that the locusts have eaten, the wasted years. Now, again, we're talking about a literal locust invasion. So, and many scholars believe that it happened over four consecutive years. There was four different attacks. There's four different locusts that are listed here. Many believe that it happened over four consecutive years. If your land is completely devastated like that, if you just think about what we know logically and naturally, it's probably going to take a lot more than four years to restore everything that had been lost. You know, they say when a, when a hurricane sweeps through an area, they say it takes anywhere from like 10 to 15 years for things to grow back, for things to be restored to like where it was previously. And we all know that down in hurricane country. So it's going to take a long time. But God says, I, I will restore those years. Well, what in the world does that mean for us? I mean, I, we're not faced with a drought right now. We're not faced with that kind of devastation. I think there's a bigger meaning here. The wasted years. Let me ask you a couple questions. Have you ever experienced any fruitless years in your life? Fruitless years. I'm just talking about maybe a, a job that went nowhere, maybe a bad investment, 
maybe a failed business. Maybe you started a business and it just completely failed. Maybe you moved to a new city. Maybe you start going to a new church. And somewhere down the line, maybe three or four or five years later, you look back and you say, well, that just didn't work out. Man, that was the biggest waste of my life and the waste of my... Have anybody ever been there before with some fruitless years? What about great loss? I know that there's, there's several people in here. Some of you have lost a spouse. Some of you have lost a child, a sibling. Some of you have lost close friends. You know what happens when we go through times like that, especially when it's attached to like cancer and suffering and different things like that? You know what happens? The grief just clouds everything. And even though the sun may be shining, it's not shining in your world. You don't see brightness. You only see the dark clouds. You only see devastation. You only see all of the wasted years. I've lost all of my future. Everything that I put my hopes in in this life, it's gone because I've lost my child or I've lost my spouse or whatever the case may be. And that grief just darkens everything. And there's a process. It it takes a long time to walk through those valleys and to walk through that. But the Bible does say the rain is coming and God does restore and he does heal. But have you ever just gotten on the other side of that and you just think about all the wasted years and all the, the, the good times and the good memories that have been lost because of loss? What about rebellious years? Have any of you ever in here had rebellious years like the prodigal son years? It didn't matter how much truth you had. You were just going to go do your own thing and live your own way. You're going to pursue sin. And by the way, there is pleasure in sin but for a season. One day, payday will come. And there are many prodigal sons and many prodigal daughters that are sitting here this morning that went out and you ignored all the truth and you lived how you wanted to. And finally, you got to that pig pen and you woke up and guess what you found? You found the mercy and the forgiveness and the grace of God. But how often have you beaten yourself up for all of those wasted years living in sin and living in rebellion? I think about frivolous years. I remember when I was a teenager, I think back to my teenage years, and I wasn't necessarily doing anything that was bad or terrible, but I'll tell you what, in many ways, I feel like I wasted them. You know what I was doing with my teenage years? I'm arguing with God. I don't want to go into ministry. I don't want to be a pastor. That's not what you're calling me to do. I want to make money. I want to be rich. I went to college. I wasn't even, I was majoring in pastoral ministries, but I wasn't even fully surrendered to God. And you know what? I had a friend that came to college, the exact opposite. He surrendered to God at a young age, and he came to college with a vision and with goals and with plans. He knew that he was going to get his degree. He even did that fast. He knew he was going to go home and work for his dad for like a year or two. And then after that, he was going to plan a church, and boom, 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 everything fell right into place. And he just celebrated his 20th year as pastor of a church, and God's done incredible things in him and through him for his honor and for his glory. And sometimes along the way, I've looked back and I said, man... That's like four, five, six years of my life. If I was more serious and if I would have got a vision of God in my teenage years, in my young days, and if I would have surrendered, think about some of those years that I've wasted. And I want to tell you young people, get serious about God right now. He's got big things he wants to do, and we don't have time to waste. What about the Christless years? How many of you got saved later in life as an adult? Where are you at? Raise your hand up. Come on, I want to see where you're at. You know what's awesome? I've never run into anybody that comes up and says, man, I I accepted Jesus as my Savior way too early in my life, and I wish I would have waited. Not one time have I ever heard anybody say anything like that. You know what I hear often from adults that get saved? If only, if only I would have known about Jesus as a child. If only I would have known about Jesus earlier in my life. Think about all the wasted years of my life. Think about what I could have been doing for Christ. Can I tell you this morning, God wants to restore to you those years. That's the promise of this verse. Now, you got to be honest. How is this even possible? I mean, you can restore a house. You can restore a car. You can restore boats. You can restore um, uh, marriages. You can restore relationships. There's all kinds of things you can restore, but you know one thing you can never get back is time, right? So how in the world is it possible, can I tell you, because we serve a God where nothing is impossible. I, I love this. There is a strange and wonderful way that God can give you back all of your wasted blessings, all of your missed opportunities, 
all of those things that you have mourned, all of those things that you've lamented, all of those regrets that you have, when you give your life back to God, there is a strange and wonderful way he opens up the windows of heaven and he pours out those blessings once again in your life. And let me give you two examples. Look at verse 26. He says this, And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. You know what he's saying? When that rain shows up, he's putting some miracle grow in there. And when that rain hits the land, it's not just going to produce a, just a little crop. It's going to produce a major crop. They're going to overflow. He's going to do wonderful things in their midst. You understand this morning that God can do more in five seconds than we can do in five weeks, five months, five years, five lifetimes. He can do whatever he wants when he wants. There, there's an awesome parable in the New Testament where it's talking about the good soil that the word of God is sown on. And in the good soil that receives the truth of God's word, just like these people did, they repent it, they respond it. When you receive that word of God, some's able to produce 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. Do you understand that when God's producing 100-fold in your life, he's able to do in three years of your life what it takes him to do 10 years in the lives that he's producing 30-fold? And it's not for us to decide and to determine what kind of fruit we're producing. It's just for us to give our lives to God. But I can promise you this. When you repent and when you give your life back to God, he has a way. He has more than a way to start opening up the windows of heaven, to pour and sprinkle that miracle grow all over your life, and to give you back in abundance the things that you may have missed and the things that may have been wasted along the way. So there's multiplied fruitfulness. But also, look at verse 27. There's a deepened sense of God's presence. Okay, two, two ways that God restores the years. A multiplied fruitfulness, a deepening sense of God's presence. Look at verse 27. And ye shall, what's that next word? Ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Hey, you've responded back to me. I'm going to move and work in such a way where you will know it will be undeniable. And you'll be able to say to the whole world around you, I will never be ashamed because I know my God and my God is great. And I was thinking about another story in the New Testament. Jesus was invited to a rich man's house, to a Pharisee's house. And he's sitting there and this woman comes in. And she falls on her face and tears start pouring down her face. And with her tears, she washes the feet of Jesus. And with her hair, she dries the feet of Jesus. And then she takes a very precious ointment worth about a year's salary at that time. And she breaks it open and she anoints the feet of her Lord and Savior. And you know what? Simon, the Pharisee, he's sitting over there and he's saying, if Jesus really was a prophet, he would know that this woman is a sinner and that he would never let her anywhere near him. And Jesus, being the prophet and the God that he was, knew what Simon was thinking. And he said, Simon, hey, he said, let me tell you a story. He said, if there was a man and he owed, he owed a debt, if there's two people, okay, and one owed a debt of, let's say, $50,000, and the other owed a debt of $5 million, and the man restored both of them their debts, who's going to be more grateful to him? And Simon's like, man, the, the guy that owed him five, I mean, $5 million compared to $50,000, like, that guy's going to be amazed. His life has changed for forever. And he looks at that woman and he says, you see her? Her sins were great. And I've forgiven her. And because her sins were many, she loved much. And because your sins are few, you love little. And do you understand the promise that's happening there? When we go through those wasted years, years that sometimes are of our own doing and sometimes that are of our own fault, and we get before God, and we believe that the rain is coming, and we start living our lives right, guess what's going to happen? He's going to show up in a way where he pours out his blessings in unbelievable ways, and the increased sense of his presence is going to get all over you, and you won't be able to do anything but talk about Jesus, and worship Jesus, and sit at the feet of Jesus, and that's, by the way, the kind of person that's able to produce a hundredfold, because everybody sees Jesus all over their life, and they give him glory, and they give him praise, because he he alone is worthy of it. Can I tell you this morning, it doesn't matter who you are and where you're from, God will restore the wasted years. And here's a practical application. Bury your past. Bury your past. I love that song. We're going to sing this again at the end. You know what is that, that song, The Made For More? 
I wasn't made to be tending a grave. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. So why would I make a bed in my shame? You know what we so often do? We go back to our past over and over again. And Satan, you know what he is? He is the accuser of the brethren. And he comes along and he beats us up and says, you can never be used for God because of this, because of that, because of the things that you've said and the things that you've done over here. You are useless. You are wasted goods. And he will try to continually beat you up. And you know what my Bible says? That's not true. My God forgives. And when you take it to the cross, he restores and he saves and he wants to restore all of those wasted years and he wants to pour out his mercy and his grace. I got a story that I hope will illustrate this to you. And it's a silly story. And I hope it will illustrate this point in a powerful way. When Dave and I were young, (laughs) we were at church one night. We were in elementary school and we were at church one night and, um, we were playing, and Dave was just a young kid, just having a good time, just a typical boy. And all of a sudden, he didn't want to stop playing. He just wanted to keep, keep on playing and having a good time. And so all of a sudden, I look over, and he is going to the bathroom in a tree, okay? And so I look at him, and I'm like, what are you doing? I'm telling mom and dad. And Dave's like, no, don't tell mom and dad. I'll be in so much trouble if you tell mom and dad. Being the smart older brother that I was, I looked at this as I saw an opportunity. I was like, fine, I got some leverage over you. So for the next like two or three years, I kid you not, the next two or three years, maybe five years, I don't know, till we were 16. No, just kidding, not that long. (laughs) But for the next couple of years, every time Dave had something on me and he's like, I'm going to tell mom and dad, I was like, if you tell mom and dad, I'm going to tell them what you did at that tree at church. And he's like, okay, I won't do it. I'm not going to do it. I mean, it was like this major leverage that I just had over him. And finally, one day after like years and years of this, I said, I'm going to tell mom and dad. And as soon as I said it, I was like, that sounded so dumb. And Dave looked at me and said, go ahead, that's dumb. No one's going to care. They never would have cared before. And all of a sudden, all of the leverage that I had over him was instantly gone. Is anybody following my story here? I mean, this is, I went really low. I did. But for a reason and purpose. You know, when Satan comes along and he accuses us of our past, it's just as silly and it's just as frivolous when you compare it to the grace and the mercy of God. And you know what you need to do? You need to look Satan right in the face and say, go ahead, tell and say whatever you want to say because that shame is no longer. I'm not that person. I am a new creation in Christ. My sins are forgiven. My past has been erased. I am a child of God. And you want to accuse me before Jesus? He'll just say, look at the blood of my son Jesus. And you know what's going to happen to Satan? He's going to run away. He's going to flee because he has no more hold on you and he has no more power on you. Can I tell you this morning, stop living in your shame and stop living in your guilt and stop letting Satan hold you back and step up to the plate and repent and move forward in Jesus' name. He will restore to you those years. And last but not least, and we're done. Last word is experience. So we got to believe rain is coming. We got to claim the fact that restoration is real. And then we got to experience. Revival is here. Look at verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Joel's prophesying here. Joel's looking ahead. By the way, Israel had it awesome. They were God's chosen people, and they were able to experience material blessings as a result of that, but God had bigger things in store for his people. You see, there was... There was still something that stood in the way of his people and direct access to the presence of God, and that was sin. And in the Old Testament, sacrifices had to be made, but those sacrifices still weren't, weren't, um, weren't good enough for the people to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies. And then you fast forward to the New Testament, and Jesus Christ became the Lamb of God that took, takes away the sins of this world. And when you put your faith and trust in him, you have direct access to God. You can come boldly into his presence before the throne of grace. What an awesome promise that is. And Joel's looking ahead to that day. And he's saying, not only will you have physical and material blessings that sometimes will be poured out in your life. You're going to have something greater than that. You're going to have me. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
We're not talking about a little drizzle. We're not talking about moderate rain. We're talking about one of those Florida thunderstorms that comes out of nowhere and drops three inches of rain in three minutes. He's going to open up the windows of heaven and he's going to pour out on us. And can I tell you this morning, we are in that day. We are in that day. I'm tired of Christians feeling like we're just living in the end times and there's nothing good that can happen. We are living in the end times. Jesus could come back at any moment, but we are living in the day of grace. We are living in the day of mercy. We are living in the day of revival. We are living in a day where God is saving people and he's changing lives. And we got to get a hold of that this morning because the second you got saved, you got all of the Holy Spirit that there was to get. And what we need to realize this morning is we got to be filled Be filled. That's the last practical application. A fountain of grace came running my way. Can I get an amen to that? Has a fountain of grace come running your way in your life? The answer to that is yes. We're living in the era where he's poured out on all flesh. Now listen, I'm not going to pretend to you or pretend or I'm not even going to try to say to you or explain to you all the things that God can or cannot do because you know what? God is God. And he can do whatever he wants to do. And he's powerful and he's great. I'll tell you, some of this was fulfilled through the apostles. They dreamed dreams. They had visions. Man, the Holy Spirit of God was poured out on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved. I mean, they experienced some incredible things that God did in them and through them. Can I tell you what? We're still living in the same day. And I'm not going to promise or, or, like I said before, try to explain to you everything that I think the Spirit can or cannot do. But I will say this. We are living in a day where we can and we must be overtaken by the Spirit of God. That everywhere we look in the daytime, (laughs) we catch visions of God. Just think about that, man. As you go through your life, as you go through your days, everywhere you look, you catch visions of God. You see his hand here. You see his hand there. You see him able to to step in and answer that prayer here. In that impossible situation, it's nothing for God. You see visions of God. Everywhere you look, at night, We go to bed and we dream about all that God can do and all that God will do in us and through us for his honor and for his glory, not because there's anything great about us, but because there's everything great about him. Are you dreaming about how God's gonna answer prayers? Are you dreaming about those people being saved? Are you dreaming about your children coming back to Christ? Are you dreaming and believing that God can and he's promised and he's a big and powerful God? Man, we're living in a day where we, when we open our mouth, all that should come out is praise and glory and honor to God. That's the kind of day that we're living in. We should be so filled and overtaken by the Holy Ghost that we can have every single bit of. That everything about our life and our perspective changes. I love where our church is at right now. We're dreaming. I'm, I'm dreaming about a third service. I really, I, nothing gets me more excited than people believing in Jesus and his transforming power. People becoming a part of his church, becoming everything God wanted him, them to be. People belonging to his church. I'm dreaming about what God's going to do and how he's going to fill up these seats and these pews and how he's going to use you to reach your neighbors and your coworkers and your family members. And nothing gets me fired up more than the stories of how he is moving and how he is working and the people that he is saving. Man, I'm dreaming about our property and, and seeing our school continue to grow and seeing our church continue to grow and just being able to reach more people, not so we have great facilities, not so that we can look at ourselves and brag, but so that God can take us and use us for his honor and for his glory because that's all that matters. I'm dreaming about what God's gonna do through the Philippines Heritage Project and what he's gonna do through our church and missions and how we're gonna be, answer people's prayers, how he's gonna make a way where there seems to be no way. But you know what? Those dreams aren't just for me, and they're not just for the pastoral staff. They're for all of us. And tonight, we're going to have a serve group open house. You know what? We need everybody. We need all of you to get on board with what God's doing here. It's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen just with ourselves. We've all got to start dreaming dreams, and we all got to start believing in big things. I got a couple. I was thinking of Ben Pierce this morning. Ben is our security director and he's also in charge of parking. I've never seen a guy that gets more excited about parking in my entire life. He's awesome. 
He goes out there and he counts the cars and then he does the math and he's got it down to like every car represents 2.8 people. So he counts the cars, he multiplies it by 2.8 and he guesses the attendance before he looks at it and almost every time he's within like five to 10 people and he's always so happy and proud and I always love to go out and ask him about that at the end of every service. How did the count go today? A couple weeks ago it was dead on. You know what else I love about Ben? We talk about going to three services. We talk about the new auditorium. I gave him a copy of our master facility plan, which, by the way, we're going to show to all of you guys in January, okay? Give him a copy of it. You know what he does? He starts counting it up, and he says, we're not going to have enough parking spots. We're not going to have enough room. The auditorium might not be big enough because you know what? God's moving, and God's working, and he's dreaming about bigger and better things. I love that. Come tonight. We need people to help with parking because it's crazy out there sometimes. I was thinking about um, Mike Gibson. He's done our sound for years. He has helped completely transform all of the equipment that we use in here as, as our music team has grown and all the things have progressed. Mike is a dreamer. Mike's constantly dreaming, even sometimes about things that are like in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and we're like one thing at a time, but I love it. It's just thinking about what God can do. And all I'm trying to say is for our church to move forward, it takes everybody getting plugged in and, and dreaming dreams in, in different areas of where you're serving. But it's even bigger than that. It's dreaming dreams personally about how God's going to use you and what he's going to do in you and in your neighborhood and in your work. We need to be filled with the spirit of God. I don't want to stand before God one day and look back on my life and say, man, I wasted it living in fear. I wasted it watering my plants and my grass. I wasted it keeping it up with my own life and my comforts and my family time. And I'm not saying those things are wrong. We need to do all of those things. We need to have a balance. But first and foremost, above everything, he needs to be first. And we need to make sure our lives are counting for his honor and his glory because he has been so good to us. And revival is here and it's happening. And I just want to see God continue to breathe on it.